are uh, very pleased to have uh, a presidential, a Democratic presidential candidate with us tonight, Tom Steyer. And for the record, as you know, we are nonpartisan. Uh, we did invite all of the Democratic candidates. It's important for us to say this uh, on the start. And we were in deep dialogue with several. And their schedules didn't allow, but Tom's did. So here he is. And, um, and I, I have the pleasure of introducing him. So he's, he's a dad, he's a husband, uh, he's a regenerative rancher and farmer. And, uh, and he's a former hedge fund manager. And I first met Tom nine years ago at the Giving Pledge. And uh, the Giving Pledge had a break, had breakout sessions of where the interests were of various um, members of the pledge. And they had education, they had medical, they had a variety of things, and environment. Now this was nine years ago. There were five of us that showed up for environment. Wow. That was it. And Tom was one of them. We had Al Gore. We had Al Gore on a speakerphone in the middle of the table. And so he, we were all talking about environment and climate change. And of course, climate change is, is what the dominant conversation was. And I looked around the table, and everybody was chatting, and Tom didn't say a word. He was just listening. And at the end of the conversation, when it was time for everybody to go back to the, the main plenary, Tom said, oh my god, climate change is it. That is the defining issue of our time. And he looked at me and he said, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, you bet it is. And so, <laughs> and so after that, after that, there were some changes that took place uh, with Tom. I don't know if that was his ultimate epiphany, but he did have an epiphany that day. And so, so I just want to give you a little bit of background about, um, you know, where he's where he's gone from there. Um, he started divesting from fossil fuels from his hedge fund, and that's an evolution. He partnered up with Mike Bloomberg and Hank Paulson, the former Secretary of Treasury, and. They developed something called the Risky Business Initiative because climate change is not only about environment, it's about the economy. And if you haven't read that report, it is still, that was 2014, it still is very, very relevant. He also has taken the No Fossil Money Pledge. And he's committed not to take any contributions from oil, gas, coal executives, lobbyists, or PACs. Wow. Yeah. He's pledged to resurrect a coherent vision for the economy and foreign policy. For he's very much for fair redistricting and an end to bipartisan gerrymandering, which we need desperately. And he's an advocate of term limits. And he and he does this in six words: Mitch McConnell, <laughs> Lindsey Graham, Chuck Grassley. <laughs> He's pledged to put us back in the Paris Accord. 
He says, and this relates to the discussion we had, the discussions we had around democracy today, he says he trusts the people, not politicians. If elected, he will declare climate change a national emergency on his first day. And he wants to break the corporate stronghold on Congress. So ultimately, you know, what we have here, what it looks like, is we have somebody who will tell the truth even though it's inconvenient. <laughs> and I think we've got a power disruptor on our hands. Please welcome Tom Steyer, Democratic candidate for president. Welcome, Tom. And I would like to introduce to, to you the wonderful Colorado Secretary of State, uh, Jenna Griswold, who will be interviewing Tom. And uh, before that, Tom is going to uh, give us a few thoughts. But since I won't be up here, uh, we're just delighted that Jenna is here uh, to, to interview Tom. And she is the youngest Secretary of State in the United States. And the first Democratic woman to be elected to the position. Keep an eye on this young lady. And Jenna, maybe you could come up and take a seat, and then Tom will join you for an armchair conversation. Thanks so much for coming, Tom. So let me say that turning down money from oil and gas and coal wasn't that big of a deal because there was no chance they were going to give me any money to begin with. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight, I'm going to talk for a really short period of time, mostly about where I think we are, and then all of the specifics in terms of what I'm proposing and the, our climate plan, I'd like to do in conversation with Jenna. And I'd like to, we want to make sure that we have enough time left over to take your questions. So if you have some questions, um, please prepare them, and we'll try and do as many of them as we can. Let me say this. This is not my first time at Air Day. There are a lot of friends that I have in this room. And this is a very specific group of people. People don't come to the American Renewable Energy Day who don't care about renewable energy and climate. So this is the choir, as far as I'm concerned. You guys wouldn't be here if you didn't care. You wouldn't care if you didn't do your homework so really what we're here to talk about, as far as I'm concerned, is what are we going to do about where we are and where are we? So let's talk for one second just about where we are. Look, as far as I'm concerned, everybody in this room should recognize that we have our backs to the wall. This is going to be our time to succeed or fail, but definitely if we don't win, to fail. And failure is going to be not just winning the presidential election, we're going to have to take action. You know, when, when Sally was saying, I said we're, I declare a state of emergency on day one, that's not a political statement that I hope will get votes. That is a statement of what I think we actually have to do, declare a state of emergency because we're in a state of emergency. And that if we don't act really quickly, that we're going to miss the window. We, you know, we're in a very precarious situation with regards to the health and safety of everybody in this room and everybody in this country and every American that there will ever be. So when we think about where we are and what you guys think about what you're gonna do about it, I would say, look, this isn't something I can get done. This is either gonna be a broad recognition of where we are and what we have to do or it won't happen. And I started by saying you guys are the choir. So, so let me just tell you a story, because I remember growing up. So my mom was from Minnesota. I, she moved to New York the day she graduated from college. But we always went back to northern Minnesota in the summer 
to a lake where my grandparents had bought a cabin in 1929. And we saw my cousins and my grandparents and all the people she'd grown up with. And on that lake, there was one tennis court. When we originally went there, when my grandparents bought their cabin, that was the fourth cabin. And by the time I was a teenager, there were probably 100 cabins on the lake. But there was one tennis court. And the guy who ran the tennis court would say who got to play. And he made sure everybody got to play, but everyone would go down there, wait their turn to play, and gossip. You'd sit around the court, it was like the town square. And you'd watch the people who were playing, and you'd gossip about the people who were playing and the people who weren't playing. If I asked my mother, my mother was born in 1924. My father was born in 1918. They're Depression, World War II babies. If I asked my, brother, my mother who Ted White was, she would say, Ted White flew a plane in Italy. That's who he was. And so if you were at that lake in 1965, the question was, did you show up in 1941? That's where I think we are. We have our backs to the wall like they had their backs to the wall. And so when we ask in the future, if we win, the question is gonna be, did we win and did you show up? And if you wanna have some self-respect and you want pe other people to respect you too, it, you don't have to fly a plane in Italy. You can drive an ambulance. You can do a lot of different things but you have to show up. And that's what this election is about. I've been at Air Day, Sally said, I've been coming here for a long time. I, I've understood what this is. But we're at a point where we're going to have to show up and I've spent 10 years trying to figure out what it means to win in climate. Not to try, not to give it the old college try, I'm not interested in the old college try. We have to win. And I have spent this whole year, people ask me why I'm running. I asked everybody in the climate movement, and I have a lot of friends here who are deep, 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 deep in the climate movement, who have given up their lives to try and win on this. And I asked, how are we going to win? Not how are we gonna move forward, not how are we gonna get more renewables. What is it gonna take to win? in the real world. And the only, and here's my answer. Take over the most powerful government in the world and on day one, declare a climate emergency. <laughs> that is what it's gonna take to win. And the second thing it's, look, the second thing it's gonna take to win, look, do the math. This is a global problem. For us to win, not to feel good about ourselves, but to win, we need a global solution. So that means on day one, we have to rebuild a coalition around the world to make sure that the world goes carbon neutral. And if we don't do that, then we feel good about ourselves and we lose. And so let's be real about where we are. If we haven't promised on day one that this is an emergency and we will get our house in order. How do we go to India with any credibility? How do we go to China with any credibility? Who in the world wants to listen to us, especially after four years of Trump? Why is there anyone in the world who wants to give us back moral leadership in the world? Which we, and it ain't happening without us. You can see what's going on in the world. Look, it's not just that we continue to increase the CO2 parts per million. We all know they're going up. We are bending the curve the wrong way. If you look, we are in a place where we're putting ourselves at mortal risk forever. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I am really happy you came out to Colorado. Can we give one more round of applause to our presidential candidate, Tom Steyer? So how, how we're gonna do this, 
I'm going to ask a couple questions, and then we're going to open it up. But I am very strict, and I'm going to be watching everybody's questions 30 seconds because we want to hear from Tom, OK? Is everybody in agreement? OK, good. OK, so just to start off, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your plan you released, the Justice-Centered Climate Plan. Can you explain what that includes? So I actually brought a card to make sure that I hit all the high points. <laughs> I'll give you kind of the, the breakdown of the plan, and then I'll talk about why I think it's different. And I've talked in a little bit about why it's different. Look, we start with, there are five points I'll make. We start with basically a carbon reduction goal. 2045 net zero across the economy. So that means building standards, EV standards, super pollutants, in effect, renewable portfolio. That's the first thing. That is something that is reasonable and aggressive and necessary. So if we have to have a goal that we absolutely are gonna give. Number two, grassroots planning and a civilian climate core. Look, we've run a bunch of climate-related propositions around the United States. The first thing I ever did in politics was co-chair with George Shultz a proposition in California against two oil companies that thought people thought were definitely gonna win. The reason I got to be co-chair is there was no one else stupid enough to be co-chair. <laughs> and we said, we will do this based on environmental justice and jobs. We will have a different coalition. We will go to the people in California who are worried about clean air and clean water. We are aware that if you look at California or the United States, the people who care about the environment, who care about climate, who vote on climate, start with Latinos, African Americans, Asian Americans. Our, that's where our coalition was. Secondly, so what we're going to do is everything we're going to do is going to be bottom up. We're going to go to the grassroots and we're going to spe specifically go to the communities who've been picked on for pollution. That's low income communities and communities of color. That's who has bad air. That's where Flint, Michigan is. That's where Newark is. That's where the bad water in the Central Valley of California is. That's who breathes bad air and all the kids are sick and have asthma. So that's the second point. And we're going to get a million people to work on this, especially young people, so that we actually are part of including them in participating in the solution. The next one is about transitioning from extractive to a regenerative economy. Part of that is going to be fair wages and employment. We're going to create, look, you want to rebuild the United States of America? That's the job. That will create millions of jobs. The question here is, how well paid will those jobs be? It's, we are going to do it. You, you can't figure out rebuilding the country on a fast time scale and think you're not going to create tons of jobs. The point is, they've got to be living wage jobs, and we've got to make sure that's part of the program. It's a huge deal. I, this is going to be something we're going to have to have organized labor on our side. We've always had organized labor on our side. It's super, super important to have working people understand it's in their interest. And as part of that, we've set aside $50 billion for the displaced workers in industries that will decline to make sure that they're held constant and that there's no question about them not being, we don't do this on their backs. Climate smart infrastructure. We're talking about $2 trillion from the government over 10 years. Frankly, the building codes we're going to put in and all the rules we're going to put in, it means the private sector is going to invest a lot more than $2 trillion over t 10 years. But we know this is going to be, what's that going to be? We're going to start with purchasing standards. We're going to redirect the assets. We're going to have disclosure of their fossil fuel participation and risks by banks and funds. We're going to change the way this, we do business here, which we absolutely have to do. So. You know, welcome to the real world. People are going to have to understand that this is real, and they're going to have to change their attitude on Wall Street. You know, someone was asking me today, what are you going to do to make bank? J.P. Morgan Chase has lent $193 billion in the last three years to oil and gas. They're the people funding coal expansion around the world. Can't happen. They have to understand they're going to lose their money. That's what they're going to understand. We're going to change... 
It's just like the mortgage crisis. We're going to change the rules, and they've got to understand they need to change their computer programs because the expectations are different from what they keep thinking. And lastly, national security and resilience. We're going to have to prepare for the problems that now we've put in place. We're going to have to understand, look, we're talking about a quarter of the people on Earth potentially having to move because of water problems. Almost two billion people. You know, if you look at the number of people who've had to move, emigrate from Syria based on the drought and the associated political problems, that's five million people. We're talking about almost two billion people. If you, if you want to understand how much chaos we can be looking at, it's a level of chaos that is hard for anybody to understand and if you think the United States is not going to be in the center of that, you're really, really, really unrealistic. You know, this world has shrunk in so many different ways during the lifetimes of the people in this room. So the idea that we can put a fence around our country and it's not going to impact us is shockingly unrealistic. And that's what the president thinks. And we cannot think that way. And we, the international ramifications of climate are going to be more than we can imagine. You, you can clap. You, some folks are waiting to clap. <laughs> well, I, I just think that um, that was so well said. And I had shared earlier that I, I grew up pretty working class in rural Colorado. So I, I really appreciate the justice focus uh, because climate is hitting, climate change is hitting a lot of communities that may not be able to just get up and move. Uh, and here in Colorado, we're not, we have so many fires, we have so many floods, uh, we see the extreme weather. Uh, in 2013, I, I don't know if you all remember when it started to rain, and it just rained and rained and rained. Uh, and I, I grew up in Estes Park, but actually in the canyon between Estes Park and Drake. And all communication went down. We didn't know what happened to my mom for days. And luckily, she was OK. The flood had hit. Uh, but our neighbors lost their entire business. People lost their homes. So when, when you say you're going to declare a climate emergency, this is going to touch so many people's lives. But what exactly do you have planned on day one? Well, when you declare an emergency, a state of emergency, when the president does that, you get a ton of emergency powers, 150 different powers. And they cover almost everything. As you can see, Mr. Trump declared a state of emergency on the southern border and moved $5 billion from what had been allocated to by the Congress to what he wanted it to be allocated to, with, and the Supreme Court upheld it. The point of a state of emergency is when the government can't react fast enough to a dire threat to the people of the United States. That's what this is. To be fair, I have said that will give Congress 100 days, so that's a little over three months, to pass something like the Green New Deal. Look, they've had 28 years to pass something like the Green New Deal. We're not close to that happening. But to be fair, this is a year and a half from now, they deserve a chance to do what's necessary. And I don't want to be disrespectful. But I do also think, we're at a place where we no longer have the time to discuss what we should be doing in a few years. We are at a place where we, it actually is a state of emergency. And if you think about the other times when we've been in a state of emergency, the president has taken extraordinary actions that you normally wouldn't. And the one I would point to is the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln took extraordinary powers onto himself to try and preserve the Union and protect the United States of America. And he had to do it. And some of those things were things that went way beyond what anyone had ever contemplated or would contemplate. And that's where we are. Please applaud. I, I'm trying to take it all in and, and really listen. And I, I, again, just appreciate you being here. Uh, it seems to me that a lot of these solutions also require structural changes. 
Uh, and as Colorado Secretary of State, I, I've been fighting to shine light on dark money, to make sure that every eligible person's voice is heard, uh, to pass lobbyist reform so we can see how money is trying to influence decision makers. Uh, is that part of your plan, and, and how do you see it? What Jen has done in Colorado is directly applicable and very close to my basic fear about America. Look, the number one thing about the United, I believe about the United States politics is that corporations have bought the democracy. That there's been a hostile corporate takeover that's taken place over the last 40 years in front of our eyes, but without us really being able to see it. And now we're in a place where we have intractable problems, the cost of healthcare, gun violence, the problems of student debt, climate change, where we think these are intractable problems. Actually, they're not intractable problems. These are problems that are very good for the bottom lines of the corporations who are making sure that we don't solve them. And the only real solution is to break that stranglehold and get back to government of, by, and for the people. That's, you know, that is my big, that's my big gripe with the democratic debates, which is I think everything they're talking about is important. I think people have really good ideas. I think everybody who's been in those debates is a million times better than the criminal in the White House. I know that. But I also know that we are nowhere near close to Medicare for all or single payer. I know we're nowhere near close to canceling student debt. I know we're nowhere near close to the Green New Deal in whatever version you want to talk about it. You know, if you look, here we are in Colorado. This is a state which has been home to some of the most famous examples of mass killings in American history. Some of them were decades ago. We still don't have mandatory background checks on every gun purchase in the United States of America, which is amazing. Over 90% of Americans want mandatory background checks on guns. More Republican voters want that than Democratic voters on a percentage basis. It's amazing, but the gun manufacturers like to sell guns, and they control the NRA, and the NRA controls the Congress through the Republican Party. So we don't get any common sense gun reform because a group of companies run the Congress of the United States on something and we're, as a result, we have American, innocent Americans gunned down all the time. El Paso and Dayton were the 250th and 251st mass shooting of the year through the first 217 days. Next country in the world with the most mass shootings, Mexico, three. That's where we are. We have a failed government. And that's really, I say to everybody, for 10 years I've been organizing an ordinary citizens in the United States as an outsider to take on these corporations and win. When, when we're talking about, I, I was saying to Jenna before, I love what she's doing in terms of transparency, the stuff she's passed here. I totally believe we need to out these people and make sure we know where the money's coming from and find people who break the rules. But beyond that, I've said, 12-year term limit in Congress for Congress people and senators, national referendum for stuff like background checks. When everybody wants it, but we can't get it from the legislature, we should be able to go to ourselves. Vote at home, which Colorado has. You know, all the things to make it easy to prevent voter suppression. And lastly, this will take some work. We need to get rid of the notion that corporations are people. Yeah. They're not. Look. It's obvious that they're not. Treat it, Mitt Romney said they were, but unfortunately, he was wrong. When we get, the, the whole notion of their being able to spend unlimited money is they're people, money is speech, people have an unlimited right to speech, therefore corporations have an unlimited right to spend money politically. They're not people. And so we need, that will take some time. We can do the kinds of things that Jenna pushed through here in Colorado in terms of transparency and fines and control on the first day. That a president can do through the Federal Election Commission. 
just so you guys know, the fines in 2018, on, in terms of breaking the law in terms of elections, were $600,000 total in the United States of America. They put through a $1.2 trillion tax cut. $600,000, $1.2 trillion. What say we break a few more laws? I think that's been working for us. Let's keep doing it. We can't have it. Yeah, if you, if you have uh, even a good set of rules, but people know that no one's going to enforce them, uh, the rules don't have any teeth. Uh, I really believe that most, most people want to be good actors, uh, but you have to have an enforcement mechanism. And that's exactly what we built into our campaign finance laws here in Colorado. So that's, that's good. You know, you had mentioned um, getting onto the debate stage. So can we talk a little bit about your, your political strategy? Where are you uh, with the next debate? Um, how do you vision uh, your pathway forward? So, so one of the things that's true about this race is it is a horse race at some level, and people see that horse race as kind of reality TV and therefore always interesting. You know, I've been doing this for a little over five weeks that in order to be on the debate stage in Houston in September by August 28th, you need to get 130,000 separate donors, which we've done, and you need, th and for the people in this room, thank you, uh, honestly, thank you. You also need to get four acceptable polls of 2% or more. In, mostly in the, and it depends how the polls are defined, but most of them in the early primary states. We had a, a poll that they don't accept this week that said in the four early primary states, which are Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada, our campaign is average at six. So if they do some more, we're, we have three out of, we have three polls, we need another poll, we're just hoping that somebody polls. Because in those states, we should be good to go. And honestly, being on the debate stage is really important. Because the question here is going to be, the question on people's minds, I think, for any Democratic candidate is, can you beat Trump? Everybody is going to ask that question first and foremost, because we need to do It's not enough, but it's an absolute essential. And the second question that I think people are going to be asking is, can you not screw up the economy, please? And I think on that, look, I spent 30 years as an investor figuring out what makes companies profitable, what makes industries profitable, and what makes countries profitable. I invested around the world. So I, there's nothing I would rather do than talk about jobs, wages, and economics with a fraud and a failed businessman like Donald Trump. <laughs> People agree with you. <laughs> well, let, let's open up uh, to some questions in the audience. John, do you have one in the back? Thanks for being so courageous. Uh, if you win, you're going to have to have a legislature behind you that can pass legislation. Um, House looks reasonably good. The Senate is a challenge. How is your candidacy going to help elect senators, both yourself and your capacity to marshal other resources? So that is, of course, a critical question. Because, you know, obviously it's, it's 53 47 in the Senate, and we need to have, we really, really need to have a sweeping victory next year. And what, we're go what is going to get us a sweeping victory? I believe this will be a generation defining election. And the way that we'll know that, so that I'm not just what, saying what everybody always says is the turnout is gonna be shockingly higher than in the past elections. People are gonna understand that everything is on the table. They are going to understand that everything is on the table because they think that if they lose, that we're gonna change the rules so that things are done fairly and democratically, and that's the end of them. So they're gonna worry that if they lose, they lose forever, and they're right. So they will show up and they will be desperate. And they will be fearful that their control of this country will go away forever. 
And we will be desperate. Because what, what I said about where we stand if we lose this on a climate perspective, people will feel across the board. So that, what is it going to take to have a sweeping win? Two things. Grassroots. You know, I started Next Gen America six and a half years ago. We've knocked on tens of millions of doors. We registered a million three Americans in 2016. We've, we did the largest youth mo voter mobilization in American history in 2018. We believe in the grassroots. We believe the way to win is turnout. That 40% of Americans don't vote in a presidential election. Overwhelmingly young people and communities of color, we've asked hundreds of thousands of people why they don't vote. And they say, nobody tells the truth. Nobody answers my questions. There's no difference between the parties. Why would I vote? And so the answer is, how are we going to have a sweeping victory? We're going to have a sweeping victory by getting that 40% to understand what's at stake and that we're telling the truth. And there will be a dramatic improvement in their life if we win. And that leads to the last question. I'll tell you a quick story. I was having lunch in Las Vegas at the largest public hospital there with all of the union staff. So, you know, in a hospital, the union staff is the cleaning staff, the orderslies, the nurses. And I asked them, do you like your jobs? And they go, we love our jobs. And I said, is that because you have good wages and benefits? And they go, no, we love our jobs because we save lives. You know, people come here, every single person in Las Vegas can come to this hospital and we do great care and we save lives and that's what we do and we have great pride in it. And I said, well, who stands up for you? Who fights for you? And they said, no one. And I said, no, I mean, who, someone must, you must have someone in mind who gets up in the morning and fights for you in DC or in Carson City. They're like, no, we think we're on our own. So when I say, how do we have a sweeping victory? We have to have a vision of, of what we're going to do and have people believe that we will give everything to do that. And if people believe that, that we have a vision of how we're going to change America together and that we will do anything to get that to happen, we will have a sweeping victory like you can't believe in 2020. And we have to do that. Well, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that it's so important to focus on structural reform is that so many people just think that corporations and special interests have the ears and the minds of, of their politicians. Uh, and to be able to really speak to people directly about what you want to do and what you intend to do for all Americans, regardless of party, I just think is so important and has really pushed my career and my vision. Um, so I, I really commend that. I, I know you have a, a question over here. Maybe this is a good segue into our next segment. Um, you talk about reestablishing moral leadership on the environment, and, and I concur 100% with that. But China is a sovereign country. So what specific steps would you take, having reestablished moral leadership, to incentivize China to be a partner, because you could have a thousand new green deals in America, and that won't make a hill of beans different if we don't get China on board. So that is, of course, a super important question. And let's talk about China for one second, because we love to think about these things in these really simplistic ways. China is, is talking about doing this big expansion they're very aggressive commercially. I mean, I've done, been to China probably 20 times. I've done business there for over 20 years. They cheat all the time in business. They're extremely aggressive commercially in a lot of different ways, very openly in a concerted fashion. They are also standing right in the path of climate change. One, you know, Americans don't understand, and I didn't understand. I have some really close Chinese friends. And I said, 
why do you guys care so much about Nepal? Like, what? What is that about? And the guy goes, are you kidding? That's the Himalayas. That's where our water comes from. We will never give up Nepal. Because if we give up Nepal, we're going to die. Well, let's talk for one second about what's going on in the Himalayas. 2100. No snow on Mount Everest in 2100. So if you think about where China is, and you think about the billion three people who live there, and you think about the water that flows out of the Himalayas, and think that doesn't happen, what that means for China and India. It boggles the mind. So if we're going to get something done with them, look, they do things that are obviously not in our interest. They're not an elected government. They've never been elected to government. On the other hand, they're the second biggest economy in the world. We're intertwined with them in infinite ways. Their failure is not our success. We're better off if they succeed. So we can't, ha we don't have a, they're a frenemy. We don't have a simple relationship with them. But we also know that we can put, get, put, give them an option for a much more successful future that also helps us. And it, it specifically includes climate. And it has to include climate in every negotiation. And I, let, let's put this in context. I, Gene Karpinski is going to tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> and I will defer to him. But my understanding is we have 237 coal plants left in the United States of America. That we've closed approximately 291 over the last five or 10 years. And there are around 2,500 coal plants in the world. China is doing a very aggressive commercial expansion of their power into Southeast Asia and Africa. And what they're doing is they're promising to invest in those countries in return for a special relationship going forward commercially. And part of what they're promising to build in the so-called Belt and Road program is 350 coal plants. We're talking about getting rid of 237. They're talking about building 350, not even in China. We're not even counting the ones they're going to build in China. So when you think about how this is going to change, it has to be in their interest. We have to take leadership. We have to work with people. But that is not impossible at all. You know, the example I use, which I think is a great example, is Iran. The Obama administration with allies gave Iran a better option of not developing nuclear weapons than of developing nuclear weapons. We don't like the Iranian government. That's not exactly our pals. They weren't elected. They do stuff that's abhorrent to Americans. We still have to work with them in the real world. If you look at Paris, Paris didn't just happen. You know, if you go back and look, the Obama administration led on Paris for way over a year before everybody actually went to Paris at the end of 2015. They did a fantastic job of working with people, starting with China, to get us in a position to move forward. We're going to, I mean, it's scary to think that we're going to actually have to be adults and do actual work and have the State Department do work and know the facts. But the facts, the people who we're talking about also are going to be, they're going to be much worse off than we are. China and India, they are not dumb. We're going to have to work with them to make sure it happens. And we're going to have to work with every other country. And we're going to have to go back to leading the world and ha doing it with coalitions in partnership, but with us providing moral leadership, because there's no one else in the world who's credible. And we're not credible at the moment. You know, I did this tweet. It's the last thing I'll say in this. I did this tweet about Hong Kong, because, you know, they're having a huge democracy fight in Hong Kong. And I said, democracy and freedom are up for grabs in Hong Kong. Where's the leader of the, of the free world? And everybody, everyone tweeted back at me, in Germany, where Angela Merkel lives. 
Well, speaking of, of women and women leaders, uh, I'm actually one of only 13 women elected statewide to statewide constitutional office since Colorado was a territory. So let's get some more women speaking. Do any women have questions? Okay. Hi, Tom, Ellen Dorsey, Wallace Global Fund. Thank you. Thank you for promising to declare a climate emergency. Thank you for the work you've done with NextGen. Thank you for div divesting. Um, I have two questions. The first is, um, how are you going to get labor on board with stopping fossil fuel expansion? Second question, that was the harder one. Second question is, beyond supporting you, what should this choir be doing right now in this moment? So I'm just writing down questions. So let's talk about labor for a second, Ellen. Labor is not monolithic. There are a bunch of different unions around this country, and some of them are actually leading on climate. If you talk about the SEIU, Mary Kay Henry, the SEIU has one of their three goals to be leaders in climate. The issue for labor is actually the trades unions because the trades do an awful lot of work. 50% of their work is for oil and gas. And so, you know, they work in the refineries, they build the pipelines, they're good paid jobs, and literally it's 50% of their work, and they are terrified about the idea that the people that they represent are going to get laid off, and that's their focus. And so they push back on anything that will make that happen, understandably. The issue here is we are going to create millions of net jobs of the very type that we're talking about. If you rebuild, if you change building codes, you need a lot of construction workers. If you rebuild the grid, you need a lot of electricians. You know, in California, I've worked on props, which are basically public transportation, which we will need a lot more of, and low-income housing propositions to ensure that they happen that have created 500,000 union jobs. The issue we're going to have is to make sure that we don't lose the argument on the Keystone Pipeline because it will provide 3,500 construction jobs when, in fact, we know that if we did, it's, it's not like the Keystone Pipeline or nothing. It's the Keystone Pipeline or a whole bunch of renewables and a new grid and a completely different energy system. So the question is, can we get them to understand that their workers will be employed? First of all, we're not getting rid of all those oil refineries tomorrow, for goodness sakes. But the key question is, can we make them believe that there's going to be millions of union jobs for trades union people in the real time, so it's actually going to let them be much more, much better employed, much more numerous. Look, one of the things I really, really believe is that for 40 years, the Republican Party has successfully kicked the bejesus out of organized labor because for them, it's a twofer. They break down the negotiating power of working people. Okay, we get to keep more money, check. And you break the arms and legs of the Democratic Party who go door to door and make things happen, check. We need stronger organized labor. We need to give people the right to organize and negotiate on their behalf against these big corporations. <laughs> Look, in terms of what to do, I know that there are a million things to do, but I really have spent a long time trying to figure out about how to win. You know, Sally was talking about what we did in terms of risky business. We did two studies to prove, in my mind, we were way too conservative, and in looking back, we were way too conservative. But we could show that we'd be richer, healthier, grow faster, be more prosperous, and be safer if we moved away from fossil fuels. And we did these huge studies, and it was always nonpartisan. We always had Republicans and independents. That's why we had Hank Paulson. That's why we had Mike Bloomberg. We did these studies, and they're, they honestly weren't nearly aggressive enough, but they made the point. And I thought, in my innocence, that if we could prove that it was good for every American who didn't own an oil and gas stock, that we would do something. 
and nobody listened. I, I don't think we changed a vote. You know, and, and I thought, okay, fourth grade civics. I, I hope I got an A, but that A was actually a D because it turns out nobody was listening because what they were listening to was the money from the oil and gas companies who were telling them, don't you dare. So if we're going to change this, in my mind, I think people, I know, I've worked on all this stuff. We've worked on, you know, I started by investing in technology research, thinking if we got the technology right, we'd do it. And then I thought, if we can prove that it works and there's no downside, we'll do it. And now I feel like, no, we just have to do it. And we have to, we have to do it. We have to win at the governmental level. This is our time. There's no second choice. And so from my standpoint, honestly, that's why I'm running. There is no, I don't see the lever. I don't see the strategy to win. I see the strategy to, to do wonderful things. And I, I'll support them. But to actually win and stabilize the, the climate. I don't see the second choice, honestly. And I really don't. And that's why I'm saying to people here, look, as far as I'm concerned, we have to be all in. It is not about me. I cannot do this. People here have to be the leaders and make it happen and really, really, really push and insist on the, the things I'm talking about. We have to declare a state of emergency. If we win and we don't do anything, we don't win. We stop the bleeding. We stop going backwards. But I'm telling you, we don't win. We're talking about how do we get it done. And we got to name it. You cannot run and on your first day say, by the way, I didn't mention it in the campaign, but it's a state of emergency. It's like, what? You can't do that. Every, if you want to do something big in the United States of America, you got to get the people to understand it and agree. That's democracy. That's the only way this works. So we have to do that. We've got to name it. We've got to talk about it. Then we have to have a sweeping victory, and then we have to do it. And that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what everybody's got to do. This will either happen on a broad-based level or it's not going to happen. And, we, you know, right here we have people who've given somewhere between their lives and substantial parts of their lives knowing that this is where we are. And that's, I don't think there's a second choice. I'm, I'm serious, Ellen. I don't see, that's why I'm doing it. If there was a second strategy, I wouldn't be so desperate. <laughs> well... We have two questions. Um, let's start over here with Hunter. Tom, you mentioned creating a regenerative economy. What do you mean by that? And second, what is the role of regenerative agriculture? Thank you, Hunter. So look, we have had this extractive model for our economy since at least 1800. You know, we basically have been digging things out of the ground and burning them for over 200 years. And that has been a way for us to fuel, you know, literally fuel growth around the world. And what we're saying is, okay, that's fine, but we can't keep doing it. It turns out there's a huge cost to doing that that we can't afford. It, it creates a danger for everyone in this country and everybody in this world. So what does regenerative mean? You know, if you think about it in terms of agriculture and you think about what we've done in the last 200 years, you know, we've basically sucked the nutrients out of the soil. You know, if you just think about it in terms of carbon, the carbon density in the soil, I think when Europeans showed up, and again, Gene Karpinski will shoot me, but I'm going to be directionally correct, was like 9%. And now it's like 1.5%. So when you think about regenerative agriculture, you're talking about restoring the health of the soil and the nutrients, but you're also talking about resequestering carbon at a gigantic level in a way that will give us a bunch of breathing space. You know, if you think about what are we gonna do to, re to actually take carbon out of the air, it's like plants. That's what we know how to do. You know, people were talking about a trillion trees. Plants, we're gonna have to do this. And so what's regenerative agriculture? It's doing it a different way that will actually be sustainable and rebuild the soil. It's not dumping increasing amounts 
of dangerous chemicals that are definitely going to run off and poison people, that may that the harmful impacts we don't know. We're going to go back. We're smart enough to do this. We have the technology to do this where we can be richer and healthier and restore the earth. And so we have to do that, Hunter. And we, you know, we, we can do this. You know, the funny thing about all of this is, as a business person, we can do all this. You know, we're smart. This society is built on new technology and change and accepting change and doing the right thing. We have a problem, which is the existing status quo businesses love to make tens of billions of dollars a year. They do. You know, the drug companies like to overcharge us. It's really profitable to overcharge us. The oil and gas companies like to prevent us from moving to some kind of renewables. Yeah, it's really, really profitable for them. I don't care. I don't care one bit. They have no right to do what they're doing. And somebody has got to stop them. OK, let's go to the question over here. Yep. Oh, thank you so much. Elizabeth Halliday, Grace Richardson Fund. Tom, thank you for coming. And this question addresses candidate Steyer. Uh, if you're talking about winning, you got to get to the end of the campaign trail. And the campaign trail is a rocky road, and you're going to take some pot shots. I'm sure this man right here knows a little bit about taking a few hits. If you've had a long and lucrative career on Wall Street, uh, how are you going to handle some of the questions that might inevitably arise when your record is dissected in the media? So my record has been dissected in the media. <laughs> <laughs> And what I've said is, look, I invested in fossil fuels because we invested in everything. And somewhere around 12 years ago, I realized, no, this is the wrong thing to do. So what I say to people is, look, yeah, definitely I wish I'd done it sooner. Yes, I wish I were smarter. There are a lot of things I wish I were better looking to, just to be honest. <laughs> but we all were part, every single person in this room has been part of the fossil fuel economy. All of us. We've all filled up. Mi hundreds of millions of Americans need to fill up at the pump to get to work. That's where we are. We need to make a change. And when people decide to buy an EV, I'm not going to say, you dirty, rotten scoundrel, why didn't you buy an EV last year? I'm going to say, thank you. So what I say is, look, yeah, I wish I'd never been invested in fossil fuels. And that's why I stopped. And that's why I divested. And that's what I'm asking everybody else to do is we need to make a change from what everybody was doing, including me. And we need to make that change together, and it's got to be structural. Because, you know, the example I would give is, we did not win World War II because people had victory gardens. We had victory gardens, and it was probably important, but we did not win World War II because people voluntarily did the right thing. And uh, the story I tell is this. After Pearl Harbor, FDR went to the big three automakers and said, we're behind in everything. They have more tanks. They have more ships. They have more planes. We need you. You are the manufacturing capacity in our society. What can you do for me? And so the big three automakers, who are Americans and patriotic Americans, said, you know, I'll tell you, they came back and said, we can do 20%. We're just going to set aside. 20% of our manufacturing capability for you guys. Because we know that we're at risk and we've been attacked and we need to beat these people. And FDR said, okay, I have a counter proposal. You will do 100% or I will close you. And they didn't build another passenger car for four years. And that's where we are. I'm not interested in people who are gonna do a small bit that won't win. We're not there. We are in a place where everybody has to change. And we're in a place where it has to be structural and we've got to cop to it and do it and enjoy doing it. You know something? Doing the right thing and succeeding and having a huge accomplishment will be great for all of us. I think, 
Have, having an America that stands for something is not a bad thing. If you think about where we are, having a vision of America where we're accomplishing something together that we do, that we're proud of, that gives us purpose in life is not something to be sneered at or avoided. That's what this country is. That's what this country was founded on. That's who we are. So why don't we just do it? Honestly, we have to do it. Why don't we do it and take pride in it? I think we have time for just two more questions, and then there's a question up front. As you may know, and one of them is here, uh, 21 really courageous young people have sued the federal government in a lawsuit called Juliana versus the United States. And we have one of them here. And there's going to be a panel on that tomorrow. If that case has not gone to trial before you become president, would you sit down with the plaintiffs and on behalf of the Justice Department and the federal government, settle that lawsuit and change the environmental policies in the United States with one stroke of the pen? <laughs> I don't know the legalities of it. I know a little bit about that suit. Do I believe that that suit is righteous? Of course I do. Am I behind those young people? Of course I am. Do I believe that people have broken the law by putting us at risk and lying about it just the way the cigarette companies did? Of course I do. We know that. Do I think that they should be liable under the law? Of course I do. Look. One of the things that's turned out to be true in this country is that corporations really think they're exempt from the law. They really do. You know, if you look at the mortgage crisis, gigantic fraud on Americans, gigantic fraud, people lying to people about their mortgage and what it would cost, taking advantage, and they actually paid $132 billion in fines for defrauding Americans about their houses. No one went to jail. You know, if you look at drug companies conspiring to addict young Americans to opioids, <coughs> that's a crime. They never in their wildest dreams believed that they could go to jail. So when we think about holding people to account in this country, and obviously I started the need to impeach it movement to say everybody gets held to account in this country. It includes corporations and the people who work there. That you have to take responsibility. It's not okay to lie on basic things and put everybody at risk so you can make money. So when you ask me, should people be held to account for doing those things over an extended period of time and should young people hold them liable? Of course they should. And I think the other point is this, young people, if you, if you I have four kids between 25 and 31. This has to be a, this is, has to be a young people-led movement. There's a reason the Green New Deal was resonant. And just a quick follow-up. If the Supreme Court, for whatever reason, throws out that lawsuit. <laughs> for whatever reason. Signing a piece of legislation to expand the Supreme Court to 11 or 13 justices. The short answer is yes. Let me just say, <coughs> something has gone, look, Something, we know this, something's gone really wrong. I mean, we really honestly have a broken government. We do. We're not doing the basic things that governments do. And one of the things that's happened is there has been this conspiracy to beat down the will of the American people. And part of it is through the courts. You know, there, is, there has been a conspiracy to use the laws to prevent justice from being done. And, that, and the courts are the prime example of it. But, so yes, we are going to have to be tough. We are gonna to have to actually get things done. We are not gonna break the law to do it, but we are going to be tough. The days of Democrats lying on behalf of Republicans in hope that they will like us, as far as I'm concerned, are over. I don't care. They be, and that's what's been happening, look. We haven't wanted to call out Republicans because their behavior is so egregious that if we name it, we think they won't compromise with us. Who cares? They won't compromise with us anyway. 
Well, I, I just, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on that. Um, sometimes that's true, but I think one of the great things we see in Colorado, we passed lobbyist reform and campaign finance reform on, on bipartisan. But I think to what you're saying that there are some just key values that we have to fight for, and, and Americans are looking for people to fight for them. But the other thing I'd say is this, as somebody from California, we have working democracies in the state. That's right. In the states. That's right. We have places where people are close enough to the people that they have to be responsive mm -hmm. in a way that they don't in DC. That's right. And so if you really look at, I'll just give you one example, immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform. We have somewhere between 11 and 13 million people who live here without papers, who participate in our society, who may have been particip participating in our society for 20 years. We have no real effort, no real ability to get comprehensive immigration reform, which Ronald Reagan did. And the reason is, it's bad for Republicans. But we have a breakdown in Washington, D.C. that is really stark and really comprehensive and across the board. And in the basic things about government, we've broken down. Yeah. And I, I hope that Colorado serves as a model for other states of what can be, but also as a model for the federal government to look and say, hey, they, this is how our democracy should work. Uh, and so it's an, an honor to serve at the state level. Uh, our last question. Thank you. Oh, do we have a little bit more time? Thank you. Okay, they reset the clock. I guess you're not the last question. That's fine. They, they give more time for Mr. Steyer. Good, good. <laughs> he deserves it. Thank you. If you lost a lung or I lost a lung, we could survive. But if we lose the third lung, the phytoplankton, which is at risk because of climate change, everyone dies, Chinese, Indians, Americans. And so I was heartened by your articulation of our global challenge. But one of the barriers to that is the geopolitics of nuclear weapons. The President has just pledged $1.7 trillion to start a new arms race to modernize the arsenal. We've walked away. The JCPOA with Iran wasn't just a deal. It was a Security Council resolution. We walked away from the INF Treaty, putting our allies in Europe at risk. And recently, Lavrov said, let's reaffirm what Reagan and Gorbachev said, a nuclear war can never be won and therefore must never be fought. So I'd like you to address the need for cooperation on security, arms control, in light of the in existential necessity of cooperating to protect our planet home? Of course it's a great question. Look, the idea that we would pick a fight with every country in the world and that somehow that would be a sensible thing to do in 2019 honestly seems a little insane. Obviously, look, this world is getting so much smaller. Everybody around this world either has or is very shortly going to have a smartphone. And they're going to be able to see what Aspen, Colorado looks like in Mogadishu. And they're going to have an ability to travel that's completely different. So the idea that somehow we're not in the in one world that we can build a fence around our world, that we can fight with everybody and somehow that's a smart policy, couldn't be less true. And every day it's less true. You know, Iran was an example of how we need partners, we have shared interests. The way that people create value in this world is by cooperating together to do things that, is in, that are in everybody's interest. Arguing along the way, but as in the United States, we need to be a trusted partner so that people know that when they deal with us, we'll deal fairly with them, that we're not rapacious, that we're not greedy. We do have to protect ourselves, but we're a good partner. And so therefore, we can do a thousand good deals together. And let me make a contrast between me and Mr. Trump. When I was running a business, one of the basic tenets that I believed in is it's better to do a fair deal than take advantage of somebody. Because you figure, look, I want to have the same people working with me over and over and over again, doing 100 fair deals together that are good for them and good for us. And so I don't want to have to find a new person to work with after I've ripped somebody off. 
Donald Trump was sued 2,500 times for not paying his bills. Because what he did was, when, you, when the bill came due, he would say, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you 70% of what I owe you or go to court. And 2,500 times people said, we'll go to court. That is no way to build value in this world. The way that we build, we need allies. We wouldn't have gotten the Iran deal if we didn't have other countries with us. We can't solve climate unless we have other countries sharing the value of preserving the world for all of us. We can't solve the nuclear issue unless we acknowledge each other's humanity and get together. We are not an island in the world. We are part of the world. We can be the leader intellectually and morally. We can be the leader technologically. We can do all these things. We have to have respected partners who we care about and treat and be value driven. And people will know this is how they're gonna behave, straightforwardly and honestly and fairly. And we're gonna stand up for ourselves. I am competitive. I am a really competitive American. The idea that Angela Merkel is the leader of the free world makes me sick to my stomach. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I consider that a ridiculous insult, but it's also true. And it should never be true again. Thank, uh, and I've been informed that uh, we do have to go, so I mean, only one. Can I, can I just make a statement? I just want to make one last statement about this. Look, I've been saying we need to break these corporations, and I've been saying we need to stabilize the climate, and I really, really believe those two things. But the other thing that's true is this. We are in, people talk as if we have a failed society. We don't have a failed society. We have the most successful society in the history of the world. We have a failed government. And if we do, it's true, we should stop bashing ourselves. This is the most successful society in the history of this planet. And if we do those two things, if we get back government of, by, and for the people where the elected officials are actually trying to de deal on behalf of the American people, and if we stabilize the natural world, we are gonna get every single thing that people think is hard to get. We are going to get health care as a right. We are going to get public education from pre-K through college and skills training for life for everybody. We're going to get a living wage. We're going to get a guarantee of clean air and clean water. We can do this. We're more than rich enough to do this. Countries that are not nearly as rich as us do it. Every other advanced country has health care as a right. Other countries without anything like our money provide pr free education through college. This is not beyond us for one second. That's going to be the floor in the 21st century if we get back our government. That's going to be the right of every American. So we should stop bashing ourselves. We have two serious challenges. We should name them. We should accomplish them because we're going to put ourselves in a position that's better than anyone in the history of the planet. And that is actually what we're fighting for. I don't feel bad about this for a second. I think we're in a position where we literally can do everything that people want, but we're gonna have to get back the government to do it, and we're gonna have to have a world we can live in to do it. Tom Sire, folks. Presidential candidate, Tom Steyer. Thank you very much.